right, let's yeah. get to this auto worker strike, which we previewed last week for you and did, in fact, happen, which we expected because it seemed like the two sides were very far apart. Now, um, the UAW, the United Auto Workers, they are taking a bit of a different strategy here in terms of their approach to the strike. Number one, they're targeting all three of the big three Detroit automakers. That is different from the past. And number two, the tactic that they are employing here, they're calling it a stand-up strike. Rather than going out at all plants at once, they're starting with a targeted few, uh, one plant, I believe, at each of the big three automakers, and then expanding from there based on how the negotiations go. So the idea is to keep the automakers guessing and also to be able to ratchet up the pressure as things go on. And finally, to try to preserve their strike fund, which is quite significant. They have $850 million in that strike fund. But if everyone went out all at once, that would only last them for a couple months. So they're trying to stretch and expand that while exerting maximum pressure on the automakers. Let's listen to their new uh, pres national president, uh, Sean Fain, announcing the strike and the strike locations. Tonight, we call on three units to stand up and go on strike at midnight if we do not reach a tentative agreement in the next two hours. We're calling on GM, Wentzville Assembly, Local 2250 in Region 4 to stand up and strike. We're calling on Stellantis, Toledo Assembly Complex, Local 12 in Region 2B to stand up and strike. And we're calling on Ford, Michigan Assembly Plant, Final Assembly and Paint Only, Local 900 in Region 1A to stand up and strike. These three units are being called to stand up and walk out on strike at midnight tonight. The locals that are not yet called to join the stand-up strike will continue working under an expired agreement, no contract extensions. Though the contract is expired, most of your contract is still in effect. Management cannot change terms and conditions of work in your workplace. You do not become an employee at will. You cannot be fired or disciplined for no reason. This strategy will keep the companies guessing. It will give our national negotiators maximum leverage and flexibility in bargaining. And if we need to go all out, we will. So um, that's the, the positive part I laid out of their approach here is it stretches out the strike fund, keeps the bosses guessing, um, and they can use it in a targeted way to sort of ratchet up the pressure. Put the Wall Street Journal uh, piece up on the screen on the tactics, which really went into detail of the, the pluses and minuses and also why they chose these particular locations. They said the free, three plants now idled in the strike emerged to sweet spots. UAW officials wanted to spread the pain evenly across the three companies, people with knowledge said, each of the three factories makes mid-sized pickup trucks. For example, the Ford Ranger, Stellantis's Jeep Gladiator, and GM's Chevrolet Colorado and GMC Canyon. In part, these plants were chosen to balance the impact across the automakers. Uh, one executive board member at the UAW said, we don't want to advantage one over the other. They also said the message with the initial targets was to show companies that wanted to continue bargaining and reach a deal swiftly, not hit companies with maximum pressure right after the contracts expired. They went on to note that these are not the factories that produce the company's biggest money makers, large pickup trucks and SUVs like Ford's F-150 or GM's Cadillac Escalade, leaving the union with those chips to play. Now, there is a potential downside to this strike strategy, which mm -hmm. is while it allows them to stretch their strike fund and sort of keep these automakers guessing, and there was all sorts of social media reports about uh, apparently there was potentially some targeted disinformation put out there that threw the uh, CEOs off on which plants were going to be struck, and then they were trying to move parts around, et cetera, before this happened, and they were completely wrong about which ones actually went out. So that's the advantage. The disadvantage is it requires a lot of coordination, obviously, across a large union. You've got about 150,000 members that are impacted by this. And also, one of the greatest, uh, most important parts of any strike or work action is solidarity. So if you have some workers going out, but not all workers going out, you've got to just keep up the level of organization, make sure everybody still feels like they're in it together. And everybody is sort of like, you know, following the plan and following the marching orders as this thing goes along. So that is the downside, potential downside of the strike. But cannot understate what a big deal this is. Obviously, the big three are some of the most iconic 
um, brands in America, you know, the automakers, the uh, auto industry famously sort of built the American middle class, has a lot of cachet with the American public. And it's another signifier of how much workers are feeling much more assertive. Um, we saw the Teamsters and the UPS workers able to secure a pretty good deal through the threat of a strike. We've got the writers and we've got the actors still out. We've had way more strike activity this year and a lot more union energy and activity than we have seen in decades. And this is certainly a part of that. Yeah, it's really interesting, the strike strategy uh, that's been happening. It's like you explained it to me in order to stretch their strike fund, but it also is like a looming threat of you can push and pull as as negotiations happen. So if negotiations go bad, then you can ramp it up. As they go down, you can ramp things there. And you can keep it also as a sign of goodwill and then use like variable pressure to try and force a close. So it's very interesting uh, actually to see it. Uh, smart strategy, to be honest, because if you just do a full-blown walkout strike, I mean, you can't, I mean, you can last long, uh, like in terms of resolve, but not necessarily in terms of the funds that they have. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. So uh, we've get, gotten a little reaction from the automaker CEOs. Um, we had the Ford CEO going on cable news and saying, oh, if, if we met their demands, gosh, we just wouldn't be able to make it. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Quickly put in some perspective, the offer that they have, what they're demanding relative to where, we, where you are right now, how much damage would that do to the bottom line if you were to say, sure, we'll give you 40 percent? If we signed up for the UAW's request, instead of making money and distributing $75,000 in profit sharing in the last 10 years, we would have lost $15 billion and gone bankrupt by now. Uh, the average pay would be nearly $300,000 fully fringed for a four-day work week. There is no per way. Employee, per UAW per employee. employee. Yeah. This is our fully tenured school teacher in the U.S. makes $66,000. Some of the military or firemen makes mid-50,000. This is four, five times, six times what they make. Did you ever consider perhaps teachers and firefighters should make more? But number it's one. Not even true. Number two, yeah, it's, like, it's total bullshit. Yeah. So just a couple things to keep in mind here. Number one, the car companies are making like record breaking profits, so much so that they felt comfortable to authorize five billion dollars in stock buybacks mm -hmm. over just the past year. And now when it comes to workers, oh, we just couldn't make it. We go bankrupt. Bullshit. Number two. Of the entire cost of a car, because this is the other thing they threaten the public, oh, car, car costs are going to mm. go up. Cars are just going to be way more expensive. Do you know what percent of the price of a new car is labor? 5%. Yes. 5%. So don't fall for this. This is all total nonsense. Of course, CNBC does nothing to push back. Well, on. I dug actually a lot into it. So right now, just for everybody to know, the average employee at the big three makes 18 to $32 an hour, depending on seniority. The wage is not kept up with inflation, even close to the way executive pay, stock buybacks, profits, et cetera, as you pointed out. The automakers offered wage increase from 17.5 to 20% over in terms of an increase over the four and a half year contract. They were arguing that they should receive compensation uh, that beyond their hourly wages, profit sharing, and other bonuses to try and keep it out of the contract. UAW says we wanna end the tiered employment status and to have manufacturers, quote, rely less on temporary workers, important, mm -hmm, because they get effectively put into the lowest tier in order to artificially lower the price and it, uh, uh, creates intra-competition. And they are pointing out that temporary workers are used effectively to like uh, use against full-time union right. workers as well. This is a big focus of some of the previous strikes that we've seen or some of the stand-ups because they want to make sure that the newer generation of union workers is also preserved. And the entire point is to try and preserve like some sort of middle-class way of life. Also, the way that he comes to that math is the same deceitful way that they use the UPS. Like UPS was like $175,000. Like that's about total compensation package. He's also using it not as $300,000 per year. He's conflating a lot of stuff over a long time frame with projected inflationary cost to arrive at that figure. So this was computed by some PR like, of course. Uh, executive. It's a good talking point, you know, for them. I saw a lot of people take it on safe uh, face value, but it's just, it's just absolutely not true at all. Like once again, we are talking about the fact that they make 18 to $32 an hour. So you can do the math. What's the percentage that they're asking for? I think it's 50%. They're asking for a 40% raise. 40 and there's raise. a very okay. specific reason why. Right. Because the CEOs of the big three, they got a 40% raise right. over the past four years. So they're saying, okay, well, if these companies are doing well, 
well enough to give the CEOs a 40% pay hike, why don't the workers who actually generate all these profits, why don't they get cut in on the same deal? And it's also important to keep in mind when you see these numbers, because, you know, uh, one of the automakers put 20% raise on the table and Sean Fain was like, no, mm -hmm. it's not good enough. And I'll tell you why. Because these workers took a huge haircut in the financial crisis. They, listen, taxpayers bailed out the automakers, you'll recall that. These workers bailed out the automakers. They lost their cost of living increases. They took a direct hit in terms of their salary, huge layoffs, huge hits to their pension. So just for them to get back to even close to where they were would require more than a 20% increase. So that's why when they look at these numbers, they're like, no, it is not good enough. You have done phenomenally well based on our work and we want in on the deal. We want a fair and just deal. And so they are standing very strong. As you mentioned, Sagar, we have yeah. um, Status Coups, Jordan Sheridan on the ground for us, giving us some exclusive content. He talked to some of the workers there about the way they are feeling about this strike and why this is so important to them. Um, I would take their word uh, for a lot more than the CEOs and their PR spin. So let's take a listen to what they had to say. What for you is the, the main reason uh, you wanted to go on strike? Is it the wages, tier system? Uh, what's the core issues for you? Uh, pretty much the wages. Uh, I, I currently work two jobs, so I want to uh, kind of like, you know, not do that to support my family. But yeah, I'd rather just work the 10 hours and go home with my family instead of leaving here and going somewhere else to do another job. So in a typical day, how many hours you work in between the two jobs? Uh, more so I work like a Thursday through Sunday thing, so it's like, it's like 16 to 17 hours a day sometimes. I'm watching these kids come in here. I work around a lot of kids that are really new to careers and whatnot, and coming in at $17 an hour, and we know what the cost of living is now. You, you can't even have an apartment. You still got to live with your parents or have 50 million roommates, and that's not enough. It's not for what we do. It's not enough. It weighs on your body after a long period of time. So, yeah, they really deserve to at least have a better starting wage. $15 an hour in this economy, gas, groceries. Uh, it, you must be really stretched economically to pay the bills. Stretched is not the word. You know, we need better wages. We need at least a $10 raise for all the work that we do. We do a lot in my department. And we're just underpaid and overlooked. And I don't think it's fair. And I think it's about time that we fight for our rights. I'm in a building that we host sometimes two to 300 people. And I'm in that building by myself, cleaning it from top to bottom and get the most extraordinary compliments on my work because I am that good at what I do. I'm just well underpaid. But we're in a crisis right now where that we are really one paycheck away from being evicted a lot of us in my homes. You can't feed yourself right. You can't do you can't do anything because you have nothing left. Do you feel you're getting enough from the president in terms of support? Do you feel you're getting enough from other politicians? Because it's one thing to show up when the strike happens. It's another thing. Are they backing you when the cameras are not here? Well, the UAW traditionally supports the Democratic Party. And last night I was pretty proud of uh, Mr. Biden, President Biden, for backing up the union efforts. And he, I think he totally supports uh, what's going on uh, up, you know, to, up to a certain reasonable time limit. And he is aware that we are the fabric of the entire country. So we're going to play some of uh, President Biden's comments for you and also former President Trump's comments, which yes. are a very interesting contrast. But, I mean, listen to their testimonials here. Mm -hmm. We can't make rent. People are in danger of being evicted. The auto industry was one of the original backbones of the American middle class. And Henry Ford, listen, he was anti-union and, you know, got all kinds of issues there. But he understood that his workers needed to earn enough money to be able to buy the product and also was part of the push to make it a five-day work week for some of the same reasons. This is part of what built the American middle class. So for these workers now to say, listen, $15 an hour, $17 an hour, how do you think I'm going to make it on that? Yeah. How do you think with the cost of living, I'm going to survive? And they're being treated like, oh, they're so ungrateful and they, they're they already getting some you know luxury style pay. It's absolutely ridiculous. And you can see why you had 
overwhelming support for a strike. And why, by the way, I mean, they elected just recently Sean Fain uh, because he said, I want to take a more militant approach. I don't want to be cozy with the boss class the way that, you know, some of the previous union membership was. And by the way, I also don't want to be corrupt the way that some of the previous union leadership was and got caught for. So they're on board for the long haul. And, you know, based on what we heard from the workers that Jordan is talking to there, they are very committed. They are ready to be all in and to actually secure the deal that they deserve. Yeah, and I, I just want to underscore, you know, what she was talking about, 17.5. Sometimes we talk in hourly terms. We don't think about annual. That's like $30,000 a year. You know, it's like $35,000 a year. As she accurately pointed out, that's actually not, it's not possible to really make it, quote unquote, on that. Yeah. Or at the, at, it's at least for some sort of middle class wage when you consider the average household income in the United States is $70,000. And even with the 40% raise that the union here is asking for, it would put top compensation at $93,000 per year. Once again, that's not total comp, but I mean, I think people should be talking in stark terms. Like think, is $93,000 for a senior worker at a plant, is that a lot of money? especially in the age of much more specialized like mechanical information with the electric vehicles that they have all talked about. It actually requires less labor in some cases. And so, but it requires more of a skilled workforce. So, I mean, there are college graduates. I did a, we did that whole thing about the Wall Street Journal. The average Princeton grad is making like 130 or something like that. And that's to 22 year old, of course, is educational difference and all that. But just put it in societal perspective, Well, $93,000. A year. That's yeah. a really important point yeah. because part of the reaction we saw to the Teamsters securing a decent deal for UPS drivers, mm -hmm. all of this class contempt and class anxiety came out because we have been so conditioned to think that the only people who deserve like a good salary and to be able to have some sort of stability in their lives are people with college degrees who are working in an office. Mm -hmm. And that is a poisonous way to think about things. These people work so hard. That gentleman who said he's having to work, $17 he here, works yeah. for the auto industry, supposedly the backbone of the American middle class, and he has to work two jobs just to make it, working 16, 17 hours a day. That's unconscionable. That's a failure, and everyone should be invested in this fight. And by the way, I'm going to talk a little bit in my monologue about some other strike action that's going on, Drew Barrymore, the writer's strike, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on there. But I looked at some of the numbers. 75% of the public is on the side of the workers yeah. here. That in and of itself is different because people have just seen the abuse of the working class. They've had it. They saw what happened during COVID, you know, people having their lives risked, people being, you know, completely screwed during COVID. And, you know, they, they bought the idea of, okay, we can see who is actually essential to this economy. We can see who actually makes these things work and they deserve a much better deal. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.